Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar about uh, creating 3D assets for AAA games. Hello everyone and welcome to this. So uh, let's get started. Uh, so first before we get going, uh, let's look at some uh, webinar rules. We'll just flash that up real quick. And uh, then also just to make sure that you can all see and hear me, uh, I hope that the connection is good. If not, just let me know. I see some tens. That's great. Then uh, let's get going. So um, before we uh, get into the topic of today's uh, presentation, I'm just going to give you a little bit of an introduction to who I am. So as I mentioned, my name is Michael. I work as a lead environment artist at a studio called EA Dice in Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, it's a uh, you know Friday afternoon here in in Sweden, and I hope. Oh, just noticed that my camera is dying from the heat. Uh, <laughs> you know it's summer, it's warm, um, great weather, and uh, I hope that you're all doing well wherever you are in the world. Um, but yeah, so uh, as I mentioned, uh, I work as a lead environment artist at EA Dice. And uh, when I started, I studied game art at a vocational school here in Sweden. And then I did my internship at a studio called Fat Shark, which is also based here in Stockholm, and worked on a game called Escape Dead Island. And then I moved on to working on several small mobile titles. And uh, also then after that ran uh, two different game development schools in the UK. After that, I moved back to Sweden to join DICE. And uh, whilst I've been here now for about five years, I've worked in a few different roles, both as an art manager, a project manager for art, uh, craft directors, and uh, now as a lead environment artist working on Battlefield 2042. And um, today's, yeah, so before we get into the talk, uh, some pretty pictures of stuff, you know, some personal projects. Uh, that I did a while back. Some uh, work from uh, Battlefield 2042. And some more personal artwork. And um, in this talk, uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, 3D art production for AAA games and uh, how the pipeline and workflow for 3D asset creation uh, typically looks like. If you have any questions uh, throughout this talk, either we'll, you know, we'll have a dedicated Q&A session at the end, but you can also write your questions in the chat, either here on YouTube or in the Discord channel. And if you don't have a link to the Discord, you can find that in the description uh, on the YouTube video. So uh, we're going to be talking about different types of assets used in, in game development and also um, the steps or the process for creating assets. And then uh, we'll do some questions at the end. So let's get into this. And uh, before we start, I just want to give a general disclaimer that this is just one way of doing things. Um, 3D art production, uh, it's you know typically... Uh, a matter of, you know, it depends. There are any number of different ways of uh, making 3D art. It doesn't have to look this way. Uh, you don't have to follow this, you know, way of doing things. This is just one way of doing it. Uh, so I just want to get that out there before we get into things. Um, and before we start, let's actually talk about what AAA means, because it's a phrase that is used very often in the industry. And uh, just so that we get a clear understanding of what it is and what it isn't. So AAA games or AAA game development, it, it is a term to describe the scope or the size uh, of a project, uh, which is both in terms of content, but also the size of the team that is making the game. Uh, 
Uh, it can also be an indicator of the development budget uh, for the game. So a AAA game typically has a much larger development budget and team size and scope um, than, say, an indie game would have. And it is very commonly used by uh, gamers uh, to describe a certain quality level of a game. So when we say you know, AAA, we we you know we expect a certain quality level. Uh, and uh, AAA games also generally have a higher price point than um, um, most other games do, such as an indie game. And when it comes to the size, a AAA studio, um, you know. Studios who make AAA games are generally uh, around 150 uh, plus employees, which means that within the studio itself, there are generally more specialized job roles. But what AAA games aren't, or what it, what it, what doesn't mean, is that uh, it's not necessarily higher quality than uh, an indie or a AAA game. Um, my video just cut out sorry about that um, um, and uh, artists working at AAA studios aren't necessarily better than other artists uh, but in general those artists are usually more specialized within a specific area uh, because of the point I mentioned before so let's look at some screenshots from you know indie games or, or non AAA games uh, so this one is from a uh, game called This War of Mine, by, made by 11-Bit Studios. Uh, which is, you know, a great game, um, be beautifully made as well. Here's another one called Stray, made by Blue 12 Studios. Also beautifully um, a visual game. Uh, where you play as a cat, which is awesome. And lastly, uh, a game called The Ascent, developed by a studio called Neon Giant, which is uh, based here in Sweden, actually. Uh, and the reason why I'm bringing these images up is to kind of illustrate that from a visual quality level, all of these games are, you know, have a really high um, visual quality. Uh, so just because that they are not, uh, you know, technically AAA games does not mean that from a visual standpoint, uh, they are worse in, in any way. They are beautiful and they're, they're all critically acclaimed games. Um, but the biggest difference typically from a game, games like the ones I've just shown and, and games that you know people usually talk about when they mean AAA is the amount of content that is needed. Um, so that's just to kind of get that out of the way. So let's talk a little bit about the types of different assets that we use in games. Um, so first, you would have you know 2D assets such as concept art, uh, which are images used uh, as references and um, to illustrate a certain vision or to show uh, you know showcase a certain environment or character uh, to be used by the development team or uh, even used in marketing to market the game. Uh, we also have UI or HUD, so human um, user interface. Um, uh, and um, uh, with that can be either menus or minimaps. Um, that's also 2D elements. And then we have things like icons, badges, ribbons, things that you see and use as you know as a player. For instance, if you you know you get an achievement and you might get a certain badge for that achievement, as an example. And, and typically, these uh, assets are 2D assets. And then 3D, on the other hand, we have things like uh, characters, of course, and that can either be the main character, main characters of the game, or non-player characters. Uh, we have props, so things like tables, barrels, crates, anything that a uh, player might interact with or, you know, um, have as part of the environment. Uh, architecture, houses, or other architectural structures, like tunnels or things like that. Uh, we also have weapons and uh, vehicles. So these are just some examples of different assets that you might see in uh, a game. And uh, in a AAA studio, usually there will be specialized artists for all of these different um, types of assets. 
Now let's look at the project development cycle that we typically see within game development. So to you know make it um, give it a very like a brief general overview, we can typically uh, div uh, divide it up into three different phases. Uh, sorry, four different phases. So at the start, you have the concept phase. This is where the team establishes a vision for the game. You know what the game is is meant to be. Very very high level. Uh, in this stage, they might also uh, try and list and, and figure out what sort of key innovations or improvements uh, that they might want to include in this game, either within their own genre, like how can we make the best first-person shooter ever in comparison to our competitors, and uh, or, or if they've you know if if it's following up on a previous game, how can we improve the you know the animations within you know our previous from our previous games and then at, in this stage typically uh, you might do prototypes which are very very basic um, you know gameplay prototypes to kind of uh, play around and iterate on what the game will actually be and then you move into the pre-production phase which is when you've sort of nailed down the concept and then you just start to flesh out the what and the how so what are you making or what are we making and how are we making it? And uh, at this point, we'll tend to do a lot of uh, what we call scoping, which is you know um, creating sort of a, a list or a backlog of all the work that needs to be done and put into the game, and then who will be actually doing that work, uh, and uh, you know for how long will they be doing that work? And at this stage, you might then also do what is known as a vertical slice which is uh, essentially like think of like a, a cake or a pie uh, where each level of that cake, you know, represents the full game. And then you take a slice of that cake. So you, you will have each layer of the cake, but you'll only have a very small part of it. And that can be, for instance, a vertical slice can be um, a map or a level, uh, one or two characters, one or two weapons, one or two vehicles, as an example, uh, and they all work. Uh, and you know, as intended, but then you know, you, you so you have a, like a mini game of that, but you know, it, it's not the full product. And then after pre production, you enter the production phase when you are actually building the game, you're producing all the content, you're you know, writing, creating all the gameplay systems, you are um, you know, designing all the levels, you're making all the characters, etc., all the sound effects, you know, and you know what you're making, so now it's you know, uh, you just make it. So to speak, and um, at a certain point, you pass sort of the alpha and the beta stage. Uh, you might also have an open alpha or an op open uh, beta uh, that uh, players can play and give feedback on. And then, when you are done with that, you go through a certification process. When, uh, as an example, if you're releasing it on console, like the console, um, uh, like Sony and Microsoft, they will have a certification process to make sure that everything works. And then the game is printed to disk. Uh, even if it's released, you know, just digitally, you typically still have a, a physical disk, and then it is released. And then once you have released the game, uh, if then this depends on what type of game you're making, but a lot of games these days, especially AAA games, have a live phase as well. So during this stage, uh, you might release quality of life fixes, you know, things that players are reporting as, you know, bugs or things that you uh, might do to improve the gameplay or the you know the visual quality as an example. You might also add new content, additional levels or weapons or you know content that players can engage with. And then after you've you know you've had your done your live service for a set amount of time, uh, you sunset the game, uh, which is when you stop making content for it. So let's move on to actual asset creation and talk about uh, making 3D assets. So this is uh, an example of what an asset creation pipeline used in games can look like. Um, and at the start, you have uh, what we call the brief stage, which is when we decide on what we are making. And then you do a blockout of the asset, and then a high poly, then low poly, you then UV map that low poly, and then we bake the low poly, texture it, and then ultimately we do a, a render or import it into the game.
So let's talk about the brief part first. So uh, a brief is something that helps us understand um, both ourselves and others uh, to have a, a clear understanding of what the asset is that we are making. Um, and this, you know, some of the stuff that, that you, um, help us inform about, you know, um, um, how this thing should work, the object in question, or things like the metrics, you know, how big it is, how big the character is. So for instance, if you are making something uh, that the player needs to be able to jump on top of, then that needs to fit a certain metric. You know, it can't be above or below a certain height, as an example, because otherwise the gameplay animations won't work, or some something like that. Um, and then uh, certain some games also have uh, destruction, as a part of it, uh, so it might need you. Know, you maybe need to blow it up, or maybe there's a gameplay sequence or a, a cinematic sequence where it's blown up, and you know that will inform how the asset is made. And then also uh, modularity, which is uh, if we are able to reuse this asset in different ways, and so it becomes you know a part of a bigger whole as opposed to something that we can only use once or twice. Uh, and the brief, it helps us answer questions like, you know, what, what are we making, as mentioned, um, and what it looks like. Uh, do we have any references or concept art? Uh, for instance, then we can include that in the brief. And then also what the requirements are, like I mentioned, regarding metrics and destruction and modularity. Uh, there are also some uh, performance or production constraints that... Um, uh, the brief will help us answer, or that, that are good to take at least take into consideration when we are creating the brief. So, as an example, how will the asset be used in the game, and uh, how has it been used in our universe? So, for instance, if we, you know, we if if you say to someone, "Hey, we're gonna you're gonna make a barrel," then that is very open ended. I mean, that can mean literally anything. It's a barrel. We know roughly what the shape should be. Like we all can picture a barrel in our heads, but is it, you know? What is the barrel used for? Is it used as uh, you know to carry water? Is it does it contain some dangerous toxic acid? Uh, is it worn? Is it new? Is it dusty? Does it have snow? Like there's a lot of different factors, you know, depending on what this asset actually fits into, uh, what universe it fits into, and and where it belongs in the world, and how it has been used in our you know fictive fictional world. And so, what kind of materials should it have? And how have those materials be, been sort of affected by the background story of this asset? You know, is it rusty? Is it completely new? Is it scratched? Is it dented? Is it scorched? You know, it um, can be a million different um, things that affect it. Uh, lastly, it's also important to you know decide if this is a hero asset or a gener generic prop. So it that kind of informs us how close to the camera will the asset be shown, and that in turn allow us to decide, do we need to have a very high-res asset uh, that we spend a lot of time on to, you know, polish a lot? Or is this a background asset that you will barely see and we can get away with just doing something quick and dirty? And then, like, how will players interact with it? And if so, how, uh, how, uh, uh, how and does that require any special work on this asset? Like, do you have a, a sequence where you the player can, you know, uh, roll the barrel as an example, then maybe we need to do something with you know the collision or the physics in in order to enable that. Uh, and and also, can we reuse anything that we've already made in the past to build this asset? Like, do we have materials or textures or uh, models even that we can use to kind of kit bash something together? So the brief itself, it should be create if you're making one. Um, and I'm not saying that when you're making personal work that you have to do these. Um, typically, in in you know in game production, you would at least make something that resembles a brief, and you don't have to do you know answer all of these questions and make something this elaborate. But if you do make something where you at least have a description of, and you know some reference images, which I think is good, then it should be done before you start doing any work on it. Um, and you can use them that then to refer back to during the entire creation process. And um, if you are making it for someone other than yourself, 
or even if you are making it for yourself, try to make it easily understood and digestible so it's clear what you are referring to. Um, use appropriate colors and, and language to highlight what is important within this brief. So for instance, if you're giving it to someone else and you want to make sure that, that they put extra attention on a specific detail within your reference, then, you know, make sure that you highlight that in, in red or in, you know, some, a color that stands out. So people, you know, quickly can, can look at the brief and then get the importance stuff of what you're trying to convey. And uh, also put your, try to put yourself in the shoes of the person that is receiving the brief. You know, does it make sense? Would it make sense to you if you got it from someone else? And uh, the brief uh, is often used and can be used by uh, either the lead or the art director when they are giving feedback on the asset because it will help them understand, you know, what is the intent of the asset that we're making. And then that when you actually see the model that you or someone else has, has made, then uh, it becomes easier to give feedback. Like, does it actually hit the brief or not? Uh, and, you know, the reason why we are doing this in, uh, to, to start with is that the in, because the initial time investment that we, you know, the time we put into making this brief, it will pay dividends later on because ultimately it helps reduce a lot of rework because we know what we are making instead of just starting working on something that we hadn't even really thought about how it needed to work, what it should look like, etc. So a uh, big part of making a brief is references and getting good references. It can be quite difficult, but, you know, Google is your friend here. Um, I use Google a lot, both professionally and personally. So when I'm looking for something, I'm trying to find, uh, you know, um, references for something, I always use Google Images, of course. Um, and you can also use Google Image Search, for instance, if you have a reference or like this similar similar feature within Google Images. So if you find something like, yeah, this is exactly what I'm looking for, give me more images that look like this, then you can click on that or use that image to search for, for visually similar results. Um, I also use Pinterest a lot uh, because it's great to find a little bit more obscure references. Um, and because with Pinterest, you get a, you know, you get a lot of stuff really quickly, and then you can go to the websites that Pinterest link to, to find more images uh, of that specific object. Uh, but I mean, what's best, you know, the best thing if you can is to go out to take your own references. So in this case here, um, you know, I was working on this, uh, playground toy, um, near the play in the playground near where I live. And uh, I thought it had a really cool uh, sort of material. And I thought like, well, maybe I should try and make this asset just, you know, for fun. And uh, then I just used my mobile phone and took lots of reference images from different angles. Um, and uh, to organize references or my references, uh, I usually either use uh, a software called PureRef, which is an open source uh, reference software, which is great. It basically gives you a massive, large canvas where you can just dump in images uh, and organize them. Uh, or I use Miro, which I also use a lot at work. And Miro is fantastic uh, because it also allows you to share it and collaborate with others. So if you are part of a team, then I would, you know, wholeheartedly recommend using Miro because then you can dump lots of uh, images in there. You can highlight, you can write text, you can put videos in there. Uh, and it's a great way to organize your, uh, your work and take, you know, screenshots and take notes and write feedback and stuff like that. Um, so when it comes to the actual references, I think it's good to try and look for references that uh, if you're making an object that you're trying to replicate exactly like the playground toy here that I showed, so in this case, you know, I'm, I'm trying to recreate this exact object. Uh, and in that case, it's, it's very useful to find references that uh, ac accurately depict the object that I'm trying to make. Uh, sometimes that won't be possible because maybe you're making something, you know, a fantasy stylized object or something sci-fi. And then that's, you know, something that either comes from our imagination or something that we might have a you know, concept of, but we don't have real life references. So then that would be more difficult. Uh, but try to find that as, you know, something that ref um, looks like this object, if you can. And then material references. Um, and, and so this is, you know, reference images that don't need to be from the actual object, but at least 
have the same materials and surfaces as your object has. So for instance, in this case, with the playground toy again, you know, I know that this object contains uh, like painted metal for the little spring thing. Um, and it also has some kind of um, fake, almost plasticky wood imitation material um, and uh, like backlight or something like that. And uh, then there was some like worn stickers and stuff like that. Um, and then, you know, I can Google those materials to get a better understanding of how uh, those materials react to light, as an example. Uh, and that will uh, massively help me when I'm building the model and, and texturing the model. And then uh, contextual references. So these are references that sh uh, kind of show you how this asset is used in real life and what type of environment it typically exists in. So again, you know, in this case with the playground toy, you know, I, I can take uh, a few images of the, the the toy on just you know on its own, um, showing me you know where it where it stands and, and you know sh showing it as part of a bigger bigger thing. So I'm not just working on the asset in isolation. Uh, because, you know, all of our 3D assets, you know, when we're making 3D assets for games, they are used in a bigger context, not just, you know, in a void. So they need to make sense. And, you know, wherever they belong, it helps me inform, you know, what material, like how the materials are affected by uh, the real world. And also it can give me some ideas of how I want to present it. The same thing like that can be, you know, inspirational references as well. Um, things that, you know, can be something that is a bit more creative and can give you some ideas around how I want to present this asset uh, if I want to add some additional details, for instance, to make this stand out that maybe doesn't exist in the real world, but, you know, might be fun to add because we are making games at the end of the day. So let's move on to the blockout phase. So um, when we talk about blockout, so this is when you start, you know, making something in 3D. And the blockout is very important because it helps you define the proportions and the scale of the asset that you're making. Uh, so you have the brief, you have the concept, you have the references, you know what you're making. So it's time to kind of realize that in 3D. So this you can use any 3D software for, you know, depending on which one you are learning or which one you need to use at work, etc. cetera. Uh, and in this stage, we tend to focus on the silhouette and the major shapes and avoid going into details because if we add details, that might be wasted work that we need to redo later on or go in and change things because the scale or the proportions didn't fit what we were looking for. And, and, and the reason why we don't want to go into details again is, you know, we need to be able to quickly um, produce and validate uh, the block out in game to make sure that it works as intended, both for gameplay and for navigation and uh, composition of the overall scene that we are making. You know, does it fit in in, in there? Uh, so yeah, quick iteration here is very important. And sorry about my camera. Um, you know, it's uh, too hot in here. Clearly. Um, uh, and, and yeah, so and while this should be produced quickly, it's good to use, you know, not to be too quick and dirty when you're making it. It's good to use correct naming, uh, you know, set up some basic materials to help you show what, you know, the different surfaces rep represent. So you can see, you know, if you have a wood material, you make a wood material, you give that same color roughly that you would have. And then you do the, you know, technical setup uh, if you are using, um, you know, however you're making your asset. So when you... When you've done the block out and you're moving on to the next stage later on uh it's easier to replace the block out with the finished asset later you don't have to fix the naming you don't need to rename things put them in the right folder or whatever like you have everything set up it just saves time and makes it easier and you don't you know uh, working in a clean and organized way is always in my mind uh, the best way to approach things um yeah and sometimes when we are doing a brief um the technical, like the block out can sometimes be provided as part of that. If you're making a brief for someone, uh, you can make a block out and, and, and give them that as, along with the brief, which can help. Uh, so here's just a quick uh, demonstration of, you know, uh, what I would say, you know, uh, is a, you know, too much detail within the block out on the left. 
and sufficient detail on the right. So on the left, you see, you know, I've added these bolts and I've modeled the coil in the middle with, you know, the correct spirals and, and stuff like that. Um, but this is quite unnecessary. You don't need that. Uh, so on the right instead, you know, it's far more, it's far rougher shapes. Um, but it's still like, and even that I maybe is a bit too detailed, but that's just to kind of illustrate that you don't need to add all the detail in there. It's just to get a feel for the proportion and scale of things. Um, and then you start adding the details. In And, and that's when we come to the high poly stage. So um, high poly is, or, you know, um, high res or whatever uh, sort of word you use for this. It's a high resolution version of our model. And this is typically where we would spend the most amount of time, um, usually, like, um, and uh, this, the high poly contains the details that we can't afford on our low poly model. So small details that usually don't require any uh, geometry in the low poly because they're very small or very flat or, you know, uh, you, you see them on the surface, but they don't have a lot of volume to them or silhouette. So things like rivets, grooves, lines, you know, that sort of stuff. Uh, it can also be the fact that we want rounded edges. Uh, if we're making something like a low poly asset, then usually it has very hard edges, but we want, you know, nice round beveled edges, then you can do that in the high poly um, and to bake that detail down later. And we usually also have micro details such as scratches, uh, if you're making a character, you might have, or like a creature, you might have scales uh, or pores for like a human, if you're making, you know, a face or something like that. Um, and important to consider when you are making your high poly asset is to uh, think about what distance you will be viewing the asset from again, well, like and how it will be used. Because sometimes certain shapes you will want to exaggerate uh, in order to catch the light uh, when you are baking it down, because when you're baking, which we will cover later, uh, the high poly detail onto a low poly model using a texture, like a normal map, then all that detail is dependent on the resolution of your normal map texture, which means that if it's a small asset and used like very far, and then uh, like your rounded edges, for instance, or your details um, might not even be visible. So before you go in and like add a ton of detail consider how is this asset actually used? Is it a cinematic quality asset that will have, you know, be right in front of the camera? Then yeah, adding those small details might be good. If it's an asset that is just a generic prop, then most likely not. And when it comes to topology, so meaning the actual ge geometry of the asset, you know, triangles and quads and all of that stuff, um, I'm going to say, you know, it's, it, I don't think it's important. Um, do whatever topology you need to, as long as it looks good. Like that's the overall thing, because we're not using the high poly for any really anything else. Um, so as long as it looks good, uh, you are fine. Um, so you can have n-gons as an example, or triangles, um, anything you need to do to make the assets look, look good. Uh, and there are lots of different ways to create high poly models. Um, one way is the typical subdivision modeling. Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, which here, so you have, you know, the, the normal modeling, this is from uh, Maya, um, that I usually use. So just modeling it, um, the, the normal way, and then you add in, uh, support edges along each edge and then you smooth it, uh, and then you get, you know, nice rounded edges and stuff like that. Uh, you can also sculpt, uh, and this case, in this case, it's from, you know, in ZBrush, this little snake, uh, or you can scan things. Uh, so I, you know, I'm a big fan of uh, photogrammetry or, or scanning, uh, which is when you use a camera, take a series of pictures of images of an object from different angles, and then uh, a 3D model is generated from those images. Uh, and in this case, it's one of my daughter's little uh, squeaky toys, the little giraffe. Oh, and now... Uh, it should say low poly here. Um, sorry about that. So we're going into the low poly stage. Um, and this is the game resolution version of our model. This is, uh, you know, what we are using inside the game. This needs to be optimized for the engine and game that we are making. Uh, and here, topology is very important. 
um, both for animation, if it's a character as an example, then um, you know an, uh, topology is very important. And in order for you know limbs, fingers, arms, whatnot to be able to deform and move correctly. Um, and also for optimization purposes and UV mapping. Uh, so if you're making you know an object um, and you are you know you're texturing it later, then the topology of the asset will be a great um, factor in how easy or how difficult it is to UV map and 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 so on later on. And then also optimization. Like we don't want unnecessary geometry that isn't actually you know supporting the silhouette of our model. And again, uh, low poly models can be created in lots of different ways. You can either build it from scratch using the high poly as a reference, or you can base it on either the block out that you've already created earlier or the high poly. So you can take the high poly and reduce it down, for instance. Uh, or you, if you have a, a sculpt or a scanned asset, you can use uh, lots of different retopology re tools, either in, say, ZBrush or other softwares like uh, Topogun or uh, MeshLab or, or programs like that and then create a low poly from the high poly. Um, so yeah, like here. So you can either base it on the, the, the high poly model and then, or you can use in ZBrush here, the um, uh, decimation master is the tool called. Um, and then you, you have your sculpt and then it creates a low poly for you. And then we move into the UV mapping stage. So UV mapping, uh, for those of you who don't know, is uh, what determines how the texture and surface color and all of that surface information is projected and applied to our model. So if you look at this image, uh, that kind of illustrates, you know, on, on a basic cube, which is I think the easiest way to explain it, how UV mapping actually works. So it's in 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 theory, um, like if you have a box and then you're cutting up the edges and then you fold it flat out, uh, and then you would be able to paint on that box and put it together, and then you would have you know the surface, you know the you know whatever you painted on your cardboard box, you would have that you know on on the box in three D instead of flat. So this is a way for us to uh, take uh, a model, uh, un unwrap it as as we typically call it, or UV map it, and then be able to paint in two D on top of a three D surface, and then you know that's applied on the three D model later. And how you lay out your UVs, it will affect a lot of different things. It both uh, either will simplify or uh, make more difficult your texturing process, uh, because if you have, um, it, it is it this is less relevant nowadays when you have texturing software like uh, Substance Painter and Substance Designer and, and stuff like that, uh, or Mari, uh, where you, you paint your textures in 3D already. Um, but at least back in the days, this would be, you know, very, uh, you, when you created all your textures in Photoshop, if it didn't make sense and all of your, like the UVs were a complete mess, then it would be impossible to texture almost because you would be trying to figure out what part of the model is that, what part is here. So, you know, it did make, you know, it would be really difficult. Um, but it still can affect it, uh, especially if you, you know, how you rotate your UV shells, uh, what direction they are flowing in, like that, that can affect the texturing process. Uh, but it will definitely affect the texel density or the resolution. So if you, for instance, are, um, when you're UV mapping it, and if you, you are um, only using part of the, what we call zero to one space in, in the UV, uh, I can show like here, uh, just moving ahead a little bit. So you can see that there's, this is like a square. Um, so for those of you who don't, haven't UV mapped before, uh, this is what we call the zero to one space. Um, so this is what um, normally, what when we apply a texture, this is the, the space that the, where, we, where we can affect the UVs. And, and, and outside of that space, uh, the texture is repeated infinitely. So we want to try and keep everything within that square. But if we only have, you know, use a little part of it, then we are wasting a lot of 
uh, what we call the UV space or texture space um, on something that we're not even going to use. Uh, and, and in that, in turn, affects performance. Because if we need a much bigger texture to get a nice resolution on our model, then uh, that's, you know, that's not good. So we want to try and, and make very optimized UVs. Uh, and there are several ways to, to UV map. Um, you can either use uh, you know, automatic UV mapping, um, which just sort of projects it from, um, it looks at, at different uh, kind of angles of the model and then just you know, makes something for you. This is very quick, very dirty, and there's usually a lot of cleanup that you need to do manually. But it's very quick. And then you can also do uh, box or cylinder or planar UV mapping, which is basically it looks the camera when it flattens the UVs, it looks from either six angles and tries to do it like a box, or it looks as if it was a cylinder, uh, or if it or as a plane, etc. So it kind of geometric shapes. Or you can use dedicated UV mapping software. Um, and there's one called Headus UV Layout, there's also one called Roadkill, and there's one called the Rhizome UV. Um, and these are all software that really helps with UV mapping. Uh, there was a question in the chat I saw. Uh, so we make high poly first and then low poly. Um, typically, yes, you don't have to. Some people start with a low poly and then make a high poly after that. Um, so it's entirely up to what you prefer. But I would say that in most cases, yes. Um, so when we UV map, try to consider things like symmetry, like is the map is the model symmetrical or can I uh, take certain parts of the model and mirror them? So for instance, consider um, the headlights on a car. Like typically cars are quite symmetrical uh, in their shape or a face as an example, like uh, take a face even. Like, uh, like human faces aren't 100% symmetrical, but like we have uh, two ears, we have two eyes, we have, you know, a pretty symmetrical face. If so, if you're making you know just a very basic character, then yeah, making it completely symmetrical could work. Obviously, in in, in real life, faces aren't symmetrical, but um, that's kind of the, the gist of it. And then you can create just uh, UV map half of your face and then mirror it over, and then you can save a lot of uh, UV space. Um, maybe there is also parts on the model that can be stacked on top of each other. So things like um, bolts on a tank or like, you know, if you're making, we have modeled bolts, like large bolts or whatever. Um, and then maybe we can UV map one of them and then just duplicate them. So they're all using the same texture space instead of all being uniquely unwrapped. That not only saves us time, but also a lot of texture space. And then are there parts on the model that maybe aren't as visible to the player? For instance, the underside of an asset that we will never see or that you will very rarely see, then maybe we can either stack that, stack that part on top of something else or scale them down uh, drastically. And then we don't waste a lot of texture space on something that the player won't even notice. And it's good to try and, and think about these things as you are modeling, especially like both your high poly, but especially your low poly. Like what of these things can I mirror or stack or uh, kind of scale down? So here's an example of the mirroring. So in on this little uh, to the left, the uh, Wally -E model uh, uh, that I made many many years ago in school, um, you can see that all the red parts of this model are mirrored. So they are using the blue uh, counterpart. So you can see these uh, treads, the arm, the uh, right eye, like that's mirrored. So that's using the exact same texture as the right version. And obviously this will become quite obvious, especially if you have a lot of details. So you, you can mirror an object down the middle. So any object that is symmetrical, like a face, but you will notice that it is mirrored. So you need to be, or at least it's very easy to notice, especially when you start adding details or you're, you're texturing and you're, you're, at, you're adding, like, like say, a scar um, um, on the, you know, the eyebrow on the face and then you're mirroring it over, then of course they will have the exact same scar on the other eye and that won't look very natural. Um, so things like that you have to consider. And then on the right is an example of stacking different parts of an asset in their UVs. So everything here that is highlighted 
by the red little box, you can see uh, are stacked elements. So all of the, you know, um, like which, what would you call them? Spiky bits and uh, the chain uh, links, uh, for instance, like all of those parts are stacked on top of each other. So they are not mirrored, but they are using the same texture again. Uh, and that's a good way to, you know, not have to texture them. But obviously, in this case, it will also be quite noticeable. Like in this, this was, you know, an early uh, model I made of quite a while ago as well. And when I was finished with it, I noticed how, like, all of those parts they do look quite repetitive. So, in, you know, what, what, an another way to get ar around with that would be to maybe have two of each thing and stack them uh, on two, and then you would only have half of the overlap. Um, you still save a lot of space, but you would have more variation. So just try to consider clever ways of, of getting around that. And then we go into the baking stage. And um, you know, by baking, what we mean is essentially projecting. And we are what we are projecting is details from a high poly mesh onto a low poly mesh. And this, like the reason why we do this is uh, is two. Uh, like one, for games, it gives us our uh, normal maps from the high poly to the low poly. So that uh, is a way to fake a lot of the additional details on a model that we don't actually have modeled. So we use a texture to represent those instead. And then also we can get a lot of other different, uh, what are called maps or texture maps that we can use as a base to start texturing with. Um, the baking you can do either in your uh, sort of DCC, so digital content creation uh, package like Maya or Blender uh, or 3ds Max. Most of the, these programs you can bake directly in, or you can use dedicated baking software like Marmoset, or you can bake in, say, Substance Painter or Substance Designer, or there's an old open source one called XNormal that I used to use when I started out, uh, which a lot of people still use. It's still going. Um, and the, the quality of your bake is very, very dependent on the, both the topology of your model and the UV mapping of your low poly. So this is why, you know, paying attention and doing, you know, consider like thinking about these things um, whilst you're working is important. And uh, you can bake a number of different maps. So the most commonly used one is a normal map. Um, and then we have something called ambient occlusion, which is a black and white texture that uh, provides some extra like self-shadowing in receded areas. And then we have uh, a map called curvature, which highlights edges, so uh, like convex areas. And then you can also like, and these are just a couple of different ones. Uh, you can also uh, bake one called material ID, which is great when you are texturing because it helps you um, when you're making a high poly model, you can um, have a material that's like, you know, maybe you have a, a, an asset where part of your model is metal and the rest of it is wood. Then you can attach, assign a material to that when you're modeling, and then you can bake that out as a mask. So when you are texturing, you can very easily select that area to make that, you know, one thing metal and the other thing wood, as an example. So just to show you how what these look like. So to the left, we have the normal map. Uh, so this is a texture that fakes a lot of um, additional detail. Uh, so this uses, you know, the pixel shader. So it's not on a pixel basis uh, and, and kind of affects how light is, uh, uh, like how, how light hits the surface uh, and, and kind of bounces back to the, to the player, like to the camera. So it looks like there are more details than there actually are. And then you have the ambient occlusion, as I mentioned, self-shadowing in the receded areas. Great for you know getting that extra depth of details that you otherwise would look quite flat. And then the curvature to highlight edges and stuff like that to make things pop a little bit more. And then the material ID map used to identify you know the different materials that will help texturing a lot, make it that a lot easier. So in this case, you know we have you know red is met bare metal and then you know the lime green is some kind of painted white metal the purple is you know some some other material etc and just makes it easier when you're texturing so here's just to show um basically when you apply these different maps and the effect of using a normal map um, so to the left you have the high poly of this object 
this, this little uh, shaving cream can. And then uh, to the right of that, you have the low poly without any textures applied. And then to the right of that, you have the low poly, but with the normal map. And then you can see that a lot of the detail from the high poly is now visible on the low poly here as well. And they are almost look identical, even though the high poly has millions of triangles and polygons, and you would never put that in a game. I mean, um, in, now there's Nanite in Unreal Engine, but you know, normally you would never put that in a game. Um, but the low poly with its normal map, that it's totally fine to be used in a game and still has, from a distance, has all of those same details. And then to the very far right, you have the low poly plus the normal and then plus the ambient occlusion. And here you then get that extra self shadowing in uh, all of these grooves and receded areas, which gives some, you know, some nice extra depth to our model. Now let's move on to texturing the, uh, you know, my favorite part, because this is where we get to, you know, really have fun and experiment. And, and so the texturing phase, that's when we start applying color and surface details to our model. And um, we define the different materials that the model has and their attributes. So when I mean, I'm not talking about attributes, I'm talking about like color. Color is very important. Um, you know, if something is too bright or too dark or too red or too um, desaturated, uh, you know, that, that may, has a, a massive, dif uh, massive impact. Um, and, and when we're making realistic, photorealistic uh, 3D models, it's very important to use the correct uh, or as, as correct as possible uh, color values. So we are looking at things as though, you know, they don't have, you know, if, if, you, if you take an image of, of anything, you know, a 3D model, uh, like if you go back here even. Now the color that we are seeing um, is not the actual flat color because it has, uh, you know, uh, reflections on it and, you know, light is hitting the surface. So that affects how the color is perceived. So if we were to use a color picker here, uh, then we would not get the actual true base color of this object. Um, for that, you would need to look at only the base color. Uh, to get the correct value. And uh, there, there are ways to do that in real life as well to eliminate any like um, any light and just get the flat color. Um, you can also use Google as a reference to, like if you, for instance, uh, want gold, you can Google like gold base color or gold um, uh, albedo, which is another term used for uh, color or the color map. Um, and then you can use that as a starting point. And then we also have, you know, reflectivity and glossiness, which is how, um, you know, both how closely this object behaves to, like, say, a metal or um, um, a non-metal, and also how shiny or matte the object is. So is it chrome or is it a matte, scratched metal, you know, uh, galvanized, uh, you know, metal? You know, that, will, that has a big difference. On, on how it looks and also how you need to texture it. And then uh, normal details, you know, maybe we have a baked normal map uh, as we showed uh, here. Uh, and this just has, you know, those details, but maybe I want to also add like some dents, some scratches, some peeled paint as an example. Then you can also add that into the normal map when you are texturing your asset and layer that on top. Uh, you also have things like opacity, if you are making grass or hair or uh, chain link fence, as an example, maybe you, you will use what we call an opacity or an alpha texture to mask out parts of the model that we don't want. So for hair, for instance, we never, never, you know, we at some point we will um, in the near future when computers are even more powerful, we will render every single hair probably like we, you know, do in, in uh, film production, um, but we're not at that stage yet at least for most games. Uh, so we need to, uh, you know, when we create hair, we usually have flat planes uh, and then you apply a texture and uh, an alpha mask on that. So that kind of masks out those, um, like the hair. So it actually looks like hair, but it's not hair. Uh, and then we can also have uh, emissive or, or glow map. And that helps uh, make something look like it is uh, self-illuminating or glowing um, 
as an example. And these are just some examples. Like there's a lots of other uh, texture maps that you can do and material um, things you can do. These are just some of the common ones. And you can texture in in variety of different software. Um, you know, you can do it in, in manually in Adobe Photoshop. I still do that sometimes when I need something very quick and dirty. Um, or you can use, for instance, Substance Painter, which is my personal favorite. And I think what most of the games industry and a lot of the film industry as well is using. Um, it's an absolutely fantastic piece of software. Um, and um, when it comes to creating photorealistic 3D models, I think it's very important to study references and you know have a lot of references for the object or surface that you're trying to replicate and really you know try to break that down like what kind of detail are we seeing and how is that surface behaving and reacting to light and uh, there's also a reason for this because when we in most game engines nowadays uh, both unity and unreal engine and uh, you know if we're using other software um, there's a, a material or texturing principle or um, like a model that we are using called PBR or physically based rendering. And that is trying to approximate how materials behave in real life. So that's why I mentioned with the color value, like that it is based on the true color of the object in real life and not just something that we, you know, that looks red enough or that looks green enough because then we probably will you know, pick something that's either too bright or too dark. And when all the other elements like reflection and metallic, like when those come into play, it will make the object not actually look like the surface we're trying to replicate. So if you Google PBR, there's lots of different guides and material you can read about this. It's very interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, that's what like Substance Painter, the, you know, that's what the, the model that, uh, it uses um, as a default and what most game engines are using nowadays as well. Um, and the reason why, you know, personally, I think the texturing part is the most fun is because this is when we really get to do a lot of the storytelling. Like we get to add all the little scratches and the rust and the dirt and the fingerprints and the labels and, uh, you know, all the little st stuff that help us tell a story with our object. Uh, so, you know, how has this been used? And really think about, like, if I ha had this, you know, if I have, for instance, my my uh, my phone, you know, how am I using this phone? Oh, wait, here it is. Um, and, you know, it will have smudges and fingerprints and, you know, dust and dirt in all the crevices. Um, and that helps tell a story about the object and how it's been used and how the owner is, you know, uh, using the object. Uh, it, does it look brand new as if it's, uh, you know, a marketing shot from Apple, then it's going to be completely clean, like that's their style. If we're making something that needs to look very realistic and uh, as it's been used, then maybe you want a few scratches or even cracks on the screen because, you know, that's often something that happens. You drop the phone and then you have a cracked screen. So just adding all of those little bits, um, which to me is, is very, very rewarding. So here is just to show um, like this uh, shaving cream can again. And on the left, we have the albedo or base color uh, version. You can see like what that looks like. It looks very flat. You know, this would be look really, really boring in a game. But thanks to all the other maps and the rendering of, of whatever game engine that we're using, you know, you get something that looks really nice. And then on the right, what we have, what's known as the roughness map. Now, this is um, like a texture that help us uh, identify like how shiny or like how smooth or how shiny or how matte is the object. So brighter values represent something that is matte um, and uh, darker values represent something that is more shiny. So in this case, like all the fingerprints and the, the dirt in the crevices, that is uh, like those aren't as shiny as the metal, for instance, of the can. So that's why you have that contrast. And um, when we look at these, you know, roughness and, and, and metallic values, as I mentioned, uh, we, we, we can look at something like this, where you can kind of see what that's actually doing and how these values uh, are affecting the, the look of, of, you know, something. So here on the left at the, right, at the top, we have roughness is uh, one. So that's completely matte and uh, met metallic is zero. So this is a non-metallic object, and then it's gradually increasing in roughness, and you can see it's becoming more and more shiny. 
and down below we have the same thing but it's you know roughness is already set at one so it's super shiny but it's still non-metallic and then we're gradually increasing the metallic component and then you can see it becomes like a chrome ball which where it's you know reflecting it becomes much darker uh, it's reflecting more of the environment um, as well so yeah just to illustrate that and then when it comes to texturing, you know, um, I think it's good to try and build up detail in layers, you know, really use uh, layers as much as possible. So in this case, we have the, you know, just this sort of the starting point, just I've, I've added some very basic materials to this model. You know, we have the label of the can, we have some kind of painted metal uh, on top and then some bare metal and then a kind of a plastic tubing where the shaving cream comes out. And then I'm just kind of adding, layering more detail on top. Uh, so first just adding a layer of like, you know, trying to matting down the materials a little bit because they were a bit too shiny. Uh, uh, and then adding some more like grime and dirt that is being built up. You can see, you know, it's coming up from the, you know, under the crevices and, and you know, just more, more detail. And then even more detail, like adding some fine hairs, adding some stains. Um, yeah, more, a little bit of scratches and stuff like that. So that's, you know, typically how, how I work and how I prefer to work. And, you know, at the end, you know, there will be several, sometimes hundreds of layers that all do their like little tiny thing, but that allows me to, and allows you to kind of tone. And I like to, to increase or decrease certain things and really layer things neatly. So um, that will add a lot more depth to your texture. So when we're done with texturing, um, it's time to actually, you know, make a nice looking image of the model that we have. Uh, so either this is by importing the game, like the asset into the, to the game and, and, and you're done, or you can, you know, create a nice render and, and have something for your portfolio. So when it comes to uh, actually exporting your asset, like you have the textures, you know, try to you re again, remember to use correct grouping and layering and stuff like that, because it, it makes it easier to um, know what everything is. But also, if you're handing over the asset to someone else, uh, it will make their life easier, much easier. And the quality of the presentation of your asset, like if you're putting something in your portfolio, is just as important as the quality of the asset itself. Because if you have a really great 3D model, but a very, very flat and boring presentation or render or lighting, then that will, you know, your entire, like the quality of the work will suffer overall as a result. And uh, when you're presenting stuff for your portfolios, as an example, Unreal Engine or Marmoset are great uh, renderers. Uh, Unreal Engine is free. Uh, Marmoset is quite affordable. So they are good for taking, you know, if it's characters or, um, props or weapons or vehicles, you can import them, uh, create some nice lighting and, and get some really great renders out of them. Uh, and when you are presenting your model, it's nice to try and give some context for the asset. If it's just floating, you know, in the void with a gray or a black or a white background, that can look quite boring. Um, so if you want, you can create some nice little diorama for your asset, just, you know, it's resting on a plane, get some nice shadows, you know, some contact shadows on the ground. Maybe you can add some small supporting props to have around that to create some nice composition and just to kind of also put the asset into context, like where does this asset exist? And it will make uh, a big difference for your presentation. And when it comes to lighting, the classic three-point lighting setup will give some really good results very quickly. And so with three-point lighting, we typically mean you have a key light, which is the main, most intense light source, like can represent the sun in, in you know, if you want to. And then you, uh, that, and then you have a fill light, which is coming from s sort of like an opposite, direct, almost an opposite direction that will help fill in the shadows on the, the side that is not being lit. And then you have a rim light from the back that helps accentuate the silhouette of your asset. Uh, so yeah, you know, if, if you want to try and put some extra thought and, and time into your lighting and, and composition and, and the framing of your uh, of your renders when you take the screenshots or the renders, uh, because it, it definitely pays off in the long run. So if you just compare this, you know, on the left uh, is if I would just throw this asset into uh, Marmoset in this case with no extra thought or care or lighting 
you know, just the, the default sky, take a camera, take a picture. I mean, it works. Could use that. Or I could, you know, do like I did in the actual render on the right and put some thought into how can I present this? You know, I, I'm not going to say it's the best thing ever, uh, best thing I've ever made, but, you know, we have this kind of grated uh, floor. I thought that, you know, that's kind of fits the theme of the movie where, you know, you see the can uh, being used and uh, I have this like, uh, what would you call it? Like liquid nitrogen gas thing coming out, um, which, you know, it's not necessarily realistic, but it looks cool. Um, and then, you know, we have some nice lighting. You can see, you know, I have a key, a pretty strong key light coming from the, the right hand side, uh, which is, you know, illuminating most of the object. And then I have, you know, a fill light coming uh, from the left side. That's kind of just in, uh, making sure that the left side is not too dark. And then I have, you know, a light coming from the back that really helps brighten up the silhouette of the entire model. Um, now, I have more than three lights in this case. Um, as you can see, this is what the actual, like, the shot looks like. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six, six lights. Um, and they're all kind of, like, you know, just adding a little bit extra uh, from a specific angle. And as you can see, this is, like, the, the actual scene is super, super basic. It's... Uh, a grated floor, plain, you know, very basic model with a... Uh, an even more basic material, and then it's a flat plane with a texture uh, as the background. But I mean, you don't really notice because it's mostly, you know, use depth of field here for the camera to, you know, make sure that it's very blurry. Um, and it may be in hindsight, I would have created something that's a bit more clean because it's a bit noisy, the background, I think, you know, when I look back on it now. Um, but, you know, it works. So that's kind of it. Uh, you know, we've gone through the asset creation pipeline or an example one. So we started with the brief, deciding on, you know, what we were making. Um, then we went on to the block out to define the proportions and the scale of the asset. Then the high poly, making, you know, adding all the details that we can't really afford in a low poly. Then we made a low poly asset, which is what we use in the in game, making sure that that's optimized and that that works well. All the while we think about, you know, how it's going to be UV mapped because we want that to be as optimized as possible. Then we bake our normal maps and ambient occlusion and so on, and then texture it, and then lastly uh, create a render. So um, yeah, uh, that's kind of kind of it. And um, you know, when it comes to sorry, why is that? Is the wrong? Oh, here we go. Um, it should say uh, something different, but yeah. So when you start making stuff uh, and start experimenting and creating your own portfolios, uh, regardless of where you are in your learning journey, um, it's it's never been easier to start with three uh, D modeling uh, or, or asset creation. There's plenty of either free, uh, open source, or very affordable software for you to use, like Blender, if you want to model stuff completely free and you know it's slowly becoming. Uh, an industry standard in uh, the games industry. Uh, Substance Painter, which I use for texturing, very affordable. Um, you know, you can have a, a subscription, a monthly subscription. Uh, and Marmoset, the same thing to present and render your objects, also very affordable. Whereas Unreal Engine, completely free. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, there's lots of tutorials available online for either of these softwares. So it's never been easier to get into and making things. Um, but the downside of you know all of this, and especially the last point of there being lots of tutorials and videos online, uh, is that you kind of get bombarded with opportunities to learn, new software to learn, new videos to watch. Uh, but ultimately, as with everything that you want to get good at, the best way is just to make things. The best thing to way to learn is to just make things. So, you know, if you are you know, watching this webinar thinking like, oh, this sounds cool. I want to, you know, become a 3D artist. What my sincere recommendation would just be to download Blender as an example. Uh, you don't, that one doesn't have to be Blender. I'm not sponsored by Blender, but, you know, um, uh, I like the fact, I like, I like where it's going. And um, just make stuff, model stuff. Make something that you think that you want to make. 
Um, that can be something that you are thinking of yourself, you know, dreaming of. Like, uh, hey, I want to make that this character that I've had in my head for a while. This would look really cool in a game. Or this is something that I'm, you know, my character from a, a Dungeons and Dragons campaign or whatever. Or maybe you're making some fan art from a film or a book or a TV show or a, another game. But just make stuff. Um, but at the same time, if you want to get a job at the end, or if you want to get a job soon or in the near future making 3D art, then also try to look at what the industry is looking for. Um, I mean, there are very few games making, uh, or like game companies making anime games in that style, uh, yet there's lots of artists online making or drawing, creating anime. Um, and you know, most game studios are not looking for that. So instead, trying to adapt what you're working on to what you think studios will be looking for and what they are creating. So if you want to work on uh, World of Warcraft, look at World of Warcraft. Try to find the artists that are working on World of Warcraft, which is pretty easy, and uh, look at their portfolios online on ArtStation or whatever. See what they've made and then try to replicate that. But do that with the understanding that they have been doing this for a very long time. So don't compare yourself too much to industry professionals because you are learning and developing. And every 3D model you make will be better than the last one. Uh, so that's, you know, try to see things in perspective and don't put too much pressure on yourself. And then post your progress and what you're making and uh, on, on forums and Discord communities for, for feedback. Um, you know, here's just some examples of the, the ones that I use. Um, uh, like the the poll account forum is a class. It's a very old school community, um, but you know, it's been around for a very long time. It's not as active anymore, unfortunately, because a lot of people went to you know Discord servers instead. Um, but it's still it's still around and it has a lot of knowledge. Uh, there's another one called Experience Points, and there's another one um, called the Dynasty Empire, and then obviously Game of Punks. Uh, so you know, there's lots of uh, communities to choose from and to engage with uh, and it's never been easier to make connections and network and make friends in this industry because it's so connected online especially throughout these com communities and then slowly start creating a portfolio with the projects that you finish um, and then when you make new stuff you replace the old stuff with the new and then gradually you will have a better and better portfolio and that way when you start updating things you can either start applying for jobs directly or companies will find you um, through our art station or through Discord communities and so on. Um, and then rinse, repeat. Do that over and over and over again until you get where you want and then continue uh, doing it over and over and over again. But then you're getting paid to do it. Um, and then you've reached your goal. I mean, you never reach your goal. You continually improve, but you know what I mean. And yeah, let's see if there are any questions. So uh, Dana said, thank you for the informative webinar. Thank you very much. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Hardik said, asked, what is the difference between Substance Painter and Photoshop for texturing? Well, there's a big difference. Now, the, the tool sets are con constantly evolving. So, you know, I, it's, I, I don't want to say, you know, you should use one or the other because they're, they're now both owned by the same company. Um, Substance Painter or like Substance uh, was bought by Adobe. So you have both Photoshop and Substance Painter and Substance Designer in the same sort of ecosystem, which is really cool. Um, but when you're making 3D models, I would say Substance Painter is better for texturing because you get real-time feedback of the you know of everything that you're doing. Um, I can't demonstrate it now. Um, Hopefully uh, I can do that in the future and a future upcoming uh, um, lesson or webinar. Uh, but uh, basically you get, you have, you can rotate your model uh, and you can paint directly on top of it and you can change, you know, any value or your texture and uh, you will get instant feedback. So it's so easy to texture objects uh, and, you know, constantly see like if I'm, making it slightly more reflective, what does that do? Whereas with Photoshop, typically you need to do it, you know, texture map by texture map and then re-import it in the engine or in the renderer and then get feedback. So it's much slower. 
So Substance Painter really revolutionized the way that we can texture objects. Uh, another question from Sid, how much time should someone take for the blockout stage for small indoor scene uh, that has two to three hero assets? Um, it's a difficult question to answer. Um, I would say however much you feel you need to get something that you like. Uh, so if you're making an indoor scene, you know, the architecture of that interior is, of course, important. And the composition of like where you... Uh, you, where you place your camera or where you, the player will will be you know uh, walking through the level or playing through the level how the player will actually in, you know see the level or the the, the interior sorry um, just making sure that you uh, place some some cameras around and then when you are working you can update that and, and and see like well does that create a better image does that does this have a clear focal point like does it make sense how you navigate through this level uh, so the the blockout is important i i would i would say spend a few days at least just making the blockout so you feel very comfortable about you know i like you know this scale makes sense the proportions make sense you know and by scale and proportion i mean like our uh, doorways like the doorways are a great um reference point for us humans because we know how um typically how how uh, uh, tall like or high like uh, the size of, of a normal sized uh, single door and we can compare that to everything else so if that feels really small like if you scale down the doorway then everything will look really big if you scale it up then everything will look really small um it's because we're comparing like you know a human should be able to walk through that uh, that's kind of how we're and and there are lots of different ways we can we can do that but doorways are great for you know um implying scale or proportion so a few days at least i would say uh another question from hardik is blender still used in the industry or only max and maya is used um I mean, I would say still Maya and 3ds Max are probably more commonly used at most game companies. Maya especially, uh, and, and especially within the film industry, Maya is more commonly used. But Blender is seeing a lot of traction and many studios are switching over to Blender because the tools within Blender are being developed and improved at, much, at a much higher uh, rate and speed than the other traditional 3D packages. So that's why a lot of them are moving to Blender, and also it's open source, and it's easier to, um, you know, get the community to add new features and be able to contribute yourself to it. Oh yeah, I forgot to show this slide. Uh, so if you want to join the Discord, uh, you can use the QR code here to get the link. It's also available in the description. Uh, so you can also ask questions or uh, sign up for uh, get new news and uh, see what else is going on in the community. What about 3ds Max? Well, 3ds Max is also, uh, I think, so and this is just my uh, my view on, on it, uh, so I might of course be wrong, but I've felt that 3ds Max is more commonly used in the US than it is in, in Europe. Um, not super sure about other parts of the world, but I think there's been a lot of American studios, US studios have used 3ds Max a bit more than, say, Maya um, in the past, whereas in Europe, most of them have used Maya. Uh, but as I said, now Blender is getting a lot of traction, so uh, I've seen several studios move over to Blender. Uh, another question from Ria. Uh, is it necessary to have a degree to be in this field? I'm a self-learning artist and focusing on portfolio more. Can you please tell me what kind of struggles you had in this industry and what to avoid? Oh, wow. Good question. Um, I No, I would definitely not say it's necess necessary to have a degree. Um, I have a vocational degree. It's not really worth much in terms of you know, um, bragging points or academic points. I wouldn't be able to get a visa, for instance, uh, because of my degree. I would say that, uh, the be in, in my opinion, the best educations or the best courses are the ones where you get to do a lot of practical hands-on work and also work with, with other people. And you have teachers that have industry experience and who know what they're talking about. Uh, there are, of course, several universities that live up to all of these criteria. Uh, but there are also a lot of universities that, in my opinion, don't. And then there are lots, a lot 
more better online learning opportunities. Uh, like game dev punks in in this case as an example, uh, and, and there are of course uh, lots of other ones um, where there are you know people who have actually done this, who do this for a living uh, every day, who can teach you the skills that you need, uh, hands on skills as opposed to uh, you know doing something for an academic piece of paper. Um, you can do go the self learning route and then complement that with tutorials uh, and uh, you know webinars like these ones you know and to get a better understanding uh, of, of things. Uh, but I think it's good to to do something that's a slightly more structured because you will be forced not forced but like encouraged to do things that you might not otherwise do uh, by yourself. So you kind of get pushed a little bit outside of your comfort zone and you also get feedback from you know, people who are working in the industry. And the feedback is so important uh, in order to progress and you get you know, to get that mentorship and, and you know, some understanding of, of you know, wh what are you doing and, and is that working? Can you try something else? You know, uh, so on. In terms of my uh, struggles, um, I thought it was really difficult to get a job at the start. Uh, so I got my internship and then I didn't get a job after the internship. And that was really difficult. So then I started freelancing, which is also quite difficult, um, to be honest. Because especially when you don't have um, any real, like a lot of industry experience, because there's a lot of, you know, small companies that might take advantage of you. Um, or not pay very well and you, you know it's a lot of hard work and you need to both do the, the work but also find the new work after the you know your contract ends and that can be very stressful uh, so I think that at the start was was quite difficult and then when uh, when you f get your first job then you know things change quite drastically because then when you start getting that experience especially at a, at a larger studio or a well-known studio then you get bombarded by recruiters who constantly like hey do you want to work here do you want to work here you want to work here so it's completely the opposite side of the problem instead of finding it difficult to find work it's difficult to say no to everyone because people come to you with like lots of exciting projects and studios that like that would be really cool but you know i don't want to leave um so at the start is definitely breaking in is the in in my point the hard part um yeah um jagadek has a question how do you design an environment with many uh, topography peaks and tree objects do you have a specific workflow um good question so for anything to do with like large scale exterior like with terrain i would you start with something uh, uh, like a software like uh, either World Machine or TerraGen or something like that. Uh, those are really good at creating what we call height maps. So they are like, um, um, they, they kind of show um, or like help deform a terrain with, you know, the necessary um, geographical height and uh, you know height information so you get like mountains or lakes or whatever it, it kind of creates that terrain for you you can also use unreal engine has great terrain tools so that would be great to um to use uh, and then you can get started quite quickly um where it creates you know a, a basic terrain for you and then uh, you create some can create some terrain materials with like you know say grass um that has both a grass texture but also some actual like grass plains so you can paint that on top of the terrain and same thing with the trees you know you place the trees uh in the level and then with unreal engine because it has really advanced terrain tools uh, it can you can set up systems where the terrain deforms around whatever like when you move a tree then you know you get automatically you get grass and bushes and stuff uh, created around that and then if you move it then it updates automatically so there if you google like uh, unreal terrain tools i will probably start with that you can get some like there's lots of youtube material on that uh you can get started quite quickly um Please make a Blender tutorials for beginners. Um, good point. Um, I think that's in the plans here. Uh, Swifty asks, what is requirement by a AAA company from an artist? What all skills we need to be having? So um, apart from the general understanding of you know, artistic fundamentals, like 
composition and if you're a character artist, anatomy, um, being able to create visually good looking images, um, you know, understanding uh, color theory, like having basic art fundamentals, basically. Uh, I think it's also good to have, you know, you need the, the technical fundamental skills, knowing what, create, how to create content for uh, 3D games that are, you know, um, that work in, in a game for real real time um, a real time game engine. So we're not making stuff for film that has millions of polygons. We're making you know we need to make optimized uh, content in most cases. So knowing what kind of restrictions uh, you need to work uh, around. But then apart from that is it's mostly like soft skills like collaboration and being able to take and give feedback, being able to communicate ideas both visually and verbally. Uh, so like. Uh, basic yeah soft skills i would say um and that's sometimes what can be difficult someone might have learned a lot of things on their own but haven't really worked a lot with other people so they haven't built up those collaboration skills and that can be a challenge for some for someone who you know has a great portfolio but maybe it doesn't have that experience and then it's a bit of a might be a bit of a shock when they start and you know you have to realize how, how much collaboration there is but with other disciplines when you are making games um is it necessary to have skills for both hard surface and organic modeling to work as a junior modeling artist in game studios? No, I would say they are typically split up. So either you're focusing more on the organic side or hard surface. If you are a generalist artist, then it's good to have a little bit of both. Um, but then you probably would mostly be doing hard surface stuff and less organic. So I would say, you know, if you like both, then experiment with both. But if you for instance, like I just want, I want a job. I like modeling airplanes. Then make just hard surface assets, and you know, let someone else do the organic stuff, or vice versa. Um, I'm self running right now. Mass classes like these help me grow. Thank you for this class. Uh, you're welcome. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Which software is used for realistic game characters and animal modeling, like GTA, Max Payne, God of War, Call of Duty, Red Dead Redemption, etc. Um, well, in most cases, I'm just going to go out on a limb here. Uh, of course, it might be different, but um, for like say, something like characters and, and animals or creatures, typically you would either start with a base, like a blockout mesh in, in Maya, or you might start sculpting directly in ZBrush. But definitely you would be uh, using ZBrush to sculpt um, like the anatomy of a character or like the fur of a, of a of a bear, for instance, um, or you can also, and then you can also use a lot of other tools to create realistic fur and stuff like that. But definitely ZBrush and most likely uh, Maya or Freeze Max or Blender. Uh, so if you want to make characters, then uh, ZBrush is also a great tool to learn. Uh, if I had to design a core combat game, which engine do I pick? Unreal or Unity? A game close to Brawlhalla but in 3D. Mm, I haven't played Brawlhalla, but difficult question. Um, I mean, Unity, I think, like Unreal, I would pick if I wanted to make like a photorealistic uh, first person or third person game that needs to look really, 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 really good. Because in my mind, in my, in my experience, uh, Unreal has uh, the edge on Unity when it comes to rendering features. Um, and um, whereas Unity, I think, is used slightly more by, uh, you know, in indie games, uh, especially like um, like top-down or side-scrolling games. Uh, but that's just in my, from what, what I've seen in my experience. That definitely does not have to be the case. I'm sure there are, you know, Unreal can be used for either or Unity can be used for either. But um, so I think just pick one uh, and then and, and, and try it out. Uh, do game studios have their own softwares like they do in Disney or Pixar? Uh, yes, there's a lot of proprietary tools usually. Like um, um, some studios have their own game engines. Uh, lots of like Ubisoft have their own game engine. Um, at EA, we, we use our own game engine. And then we, of course, and all studios will have their own tools specific to certain software uh, that help you make things quicker uh, or based on the games that we're making or the type of artwork that they're making just to, uh, yeah, just streamline and, and improve the life of the artists, for instance. Um, 
So like in, in at Disney and Pixar, like they have their own renderers. Like they have uh, at Pixar, they use RenderMan. I think Disney probably uses the same uh, for most of their movies. And so that the equivalent of that in the games industry is you know the game engine that they use. Uh, and and it, like Pixar have their own renderer. Uh, we have our own game engine. Ubisoft have their own game engine. Uh, lots of studios have their own game engines. And also lots of studios use either Unity or Unreal or any of the other commercially available game engines as well. Uh, for character, we have to use ZBrush for detailing after Maya. Typically, yes, that is the usual workflow. Uh, you do a base mesh in Maya, and then you bring it into ZBrush for sculpting. That's that's the, the general uh, boilerplate workflow, yes. Uh, what are your PC specifications for your work to run smooth? Um, well, I personally have uh, GTX... 380, 370, or something like that. Uh, I don't have the new 4 series, uh, but now yeah, 380, I think, uh, which works well. And then um, like 64 gigs or 128 gigs of RAM and a pretty good CPU. Uh, I mean, you can you can even do modeling on a on a laptop if you have a good, a decent enough, a decent laptop. Uh, it's not necessary to have a super high end computer to get started. Um, but obviously, if you're if you're doing really advanced simulation stuff in a game engine or in Maya or Houdini, which is another software that's often used for simulations and VFX and stuff like that, uh, then yeah, you probably need something a bit more powerful. Um, but usually, um, you, you can get a you can start working with pretty uh, low spec PCs. Uh, it's when you start doing really advanced stuff that you need a more high end machine. What about character or and animal texturing? Uh, yeah, like uh, again, uh, if you've made like a character, you have your high poly, you bake out your maps. Same thing with a, an, an animal. You have like fur or whatever you might have, and then you uh, bring that into say Substance Painter, and then you can you can project stuff on top. Um, so you, for instance, if you have a photo of a of a bear, like the fur, like you have maybe a close up photo, you can use that to project the color on top of that as an example. So that's just one way. Or you can also scan stuff like for characters. We in the games industry. Yeah. And film industry, we scan a lot, of, a lot of things. So we can, you know, someone you put someone's face in a, a photometric rig, and then they take a lot of pictures, and then you get a face, um, a scanned face, and you use that as the base. Uh, and I saw there was a question about the, the tablet. I, I personally, yes, I would always have a tablet, especially if you are painting and texturing and sculpting. Also, it's not a must. You can get away with just using the mouse, but uh, I'm so used to using a tablet now for those uh, those things. Uh, uh, what are the studios actually looking for in a portfolio for modeling and texturing? Anything that focuses on? Do you also see qualifications for good? Um, well, I mean, um, I would say studios tend to look for the, the things that I mentioned before, like uh, good art quality, composition, material, definition of an, a 3D asset. Like, does it look like what you are trying to replicate? Uh, is the lighting composition of the object when you're rendering, does the image look good? Um, does it seem like it's technically sound, you know, optimized for, for games? And then uh, qualifications, no, like we don't look at grades or stuff like that. Not At least not... Um, uh, where where I'm based in in Sweden or and in, in my experience at other in other countries, uh, we don't tend to look at qualifications or grades. I can't speak exactly for where you are. Um, obviously, it might be different, but in in my experience, no, we don't care about grades. Like the portfolio is what's the most important part, and then it's the interview after that. So the portfolio will give you the interview, and in the interview, you can convince you convince both the company convinces you that you know you want to work for the company uh, but also you can convince the company that um, you know you are the right person for that role <laughs> thank you Jagadek for that invite um, and yeah Thank you so much for all of your questions and for uh, for <laughs> listening to me ramble about uh, 
game art. It's been a lot of fun. I hope that you learned something from it and that it was was helpful. Uh, you can engage with Game Dev Punks in a lot of different ways. Sign, you know, uh, follow us on Instagram. Uh, on uh, uh, oh, sorry, the camera again. Uh, and, and join the Discord server. Uh, please do, and then you'll be given a lot of updates on uh, whatever is next. Um, do, 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 do. Just reading the last questions. So last two questions, and then we'll round off. Uh, so when showcasing my portfolio, should I showcase any of my personal work or the work I specifically made for the studios? Uh, both. Like, personal work is probably where you get to express more, most about yourself. Uh, but of course, if you're making something for a studio specifically, like you want to work on the next uh, Red Dead Redemption game, and you're making that, re you are remaking their main character, then of course, that's really, really good. Like, studios love seeing that you are tailoring your portfolio to work at them, um, their studio. Like, that increases your chances a lot by doing that. Uh, which software is used for games and movies, assets, vehicle, environment, interior, extremely? Like again, it's you know Maya, 3ds Max, Blender, um, whatever you, you decide. Uh, Maya, I would say for film mostly, uh, but 3ds Max and Blender are used quite a lot as well. Great. Well, um, that's it. Uh, I'm gonna say a good evening. Well, it's evening here in 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 Sweden, in Stockholm. I'm not sure what. I think it's probably later where most of you are. Um, but again, thank you so much for joining. And uh, if you want to ask more questions, feel free to join the Discord server. Thank you very much. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.